The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. Uh, the next presenter was supposed to be Dr. Billah, uh, Muntasi Billah. Uh, he is a bridge engineer uh, working uh, in Vancouver for Parsons. Uh, he completed his PhD uh, on uh, shape mirror in forced concrete uh, bridge columns uh, in 2015. Uh, he is the recipient of the uh, UBC Governor General's Gold Medal in the PhD category in 2015. So I'm presenting on, on his behalf. So the title of this presentation, as you see, the seismic design of shape memorial art in forced concrete bridge pier. Okay. So the outline is I'll talk up briefly about the current seismic design philosophy and what is performance-based design, what we understand, and how we can develop the procedure if we are using some new materials. And then I'll show you a, one design example and with conclusion. So <clears throat> obviously current seismic design philosophy is uh, life safety is the most important, and this is ensured by preventing collapse of the bridge. And here this example is showing unseating uh, of bridge spans. And we can also have failures like this where we have successive accumulation of residual strain that, it, that will eventually cause collapse uh, as the material going into nonlinearity again and again. So now obviously we call those as failure of bridges. Now the question is when we currently, uh, as per our current seismic design, uh, we design our bridges and we allow them to experience major damages. Now the question is the design, is this a successful design? Okay. So as you're allowing you know, large damages in your plastic hinges, you are allowing large cracks, uh, spalling of concrete, and if any region experiences large major earthquake, that what we have seen in recent past earthquakes like in Christchurch in 2011, uh, in Chile 2010, where we have seen that the infrastructure experienced huge damages and the damage was more than $20 billion, so we, which is a huge economic setback for a country or a region. So uh, the current seismic, seismic design is allowing to experience, as we understand, huge damages and uh, it disrupts traffic and it may incur huge uh, loss in terms of uh, uh, reboosting again the infrastructure and make, bringing them into service. Now, obviously, as structural engineers, we would like to improve our seismic design so that we can minimize our damage, we can minimize the residual drift, uh, we can keep our bridges operational, um, and these are the things that will dictate us to somehow we can define in our design that what are the performance objectives we will have. So that leads to our performance-based design. So then we define some damage state or limit state while we are talking about performance design. For example, we can say that, okay, I, uh, the bridge owner or DOT may say that, okay, to the structure engineers that you cannot, we cannot allow a bridge to even crack or it will only have yielding, no more than that, or it will have spalling or, you know, it may have concrete core crushing, which is not expected. So these are the different objectives that we, def we can define. But the question is, is it going to be enough to protect our investment? Because here we are defining damage state, means you are allowing damage in your structure, which means you are again going into only life safety, not the safety of your infrastructure. So we have to come out of that and we have to think about even further how we can even protect our investment. So how we can do that? So you have obviously seen uh, these different kinds of structural systems People are doing testing and even they are being implemented, like rocking structures where you do vertical post tensioning. So, and uh, this kind of system helps you for cell centering the structure after the arc is gone by having this flag shaped hysteresis. So, this kind, of, this kind of hysteresis that you experience where they don't do like conventional structures where you have large residual or permanent deformation. So, there is also another way you can think about how about even if we, because this 
kind of structural systems, we are uh, getting used to it. But if we think about conventional structures, conventional design, most of our structural engineers are not being familiar with this kind of system. So we can think of another system where we, instead of using regular steel in your concrete column, we can use some other material that will help us this kind of cell centering. So uh, we using regular steel, we understand that it goes under large nonlinearity and after yielding, if you unload, there is your permanent set. That is causing you eventual collapse or significant damage of your structure. But if we can use a special kind of alloy or metal that can go into yielding and then when you unload it, rather than going straight, having, having so after you know, unloading, rather than coming here, it may come back to the original shape and then original position, then you can actually avoid permanent damage. So obviously this kind of material do exist and they are called super elastic shape memory alloy and there are different types of alloys available. Even in the market, you can buy them. And if you look into the element level performance under reverse cyclic loading for columns, regular columns, this is the hysteresis that you are familiar with where you have large permanent deformation. Whereas this kind of structural elements, if you test under shake table or under reverse cyclic load, they will show you this kind of flag-shaped hysteresis where your residual deformation is significantly minimized and your permanent damage or the damage will be minimized as well. So now, if we have this kind of new type of element we would like to use, we would like to have a uh, framework for its design. How we can do that? Uh, considering the performance-based design, so you can, uh, obviously we need to define what are the performance objectives and we do our de uh, preliminary design and then we assess our performance, whether uh, it is meeting those objectives. If not, then we redesign and if it is done, then our uh, design is done. So now while we define performance objectives, we have to define some damage states. So in terms of defining damage states, you can follow different frameworks that are available in the literature. So one could be, uh, you know, like we can say fully operational, operational life safety collapse that is uh, most known. So, and in order to define those damage states, we can also uh, do some step-by-step -step, uh, procedure where we can select, like there are different types of alloys available, shape mirror alloys, you can select the alloy, you can define, uh, design the bridge pier, and then you find out the moment curvature response that, or the uh, push-up response and find out your capacity, your design level is okay. You select some ground motions, and then you do IDA, incremental dynamic time history analysis, and then you capture the different performance limits for each earthquake at different intensity, and then develop the dynamic pushover response, and then uh, you uh, obtain the drift limit at different performance levels, and then you define the drift limits, and that is your uh, damage state. So I can give you the example uh, that we have done. So we have considered five uh, different types of shape memory alloys, and these are their different properties. And then with all those five different alloys, we have designed a bridge, which is 9.14 meter long, and uh, 1.83 uh, meter in diameter, and so this is the reinforcement uh, ratios for different uh, alloys, and then we check like where all the columns have similar capacity uh, in terms of moment curvature and uh, base shear displacement, and then uh, obviously uh, we modeled it in seismos track and we validated our model uh, with shake table test as well as uh, different re uh, reverse cyclic load test and then we defined our hazard levels as per Canadian Highway Bridge Design Code, uh, the one that she showed, uh, and we considered 10 different earthquakes and we matched the spectrum. And then we defined some damage states uh, in terms of cracking of concrete, yielding of reinforcement, spalling of concrete, and core crushing. And all those are defined in terms of the strain level. And then when we are doing the dynamic time history analysis, we are observing when the strains are being breached. And then you develop the pushover response curve. And then for each damage state, for that particular strain, you also observe, because we have three uh, different hazard level. And for each hazard level, you observe, OK, for yielding, uh, what are the, how many data you have? You gather all of them. And then you follow the distribution pattern. 
and then you follow what is the median, and that defines your damage state for yielding for a particular uh, hazard level. And considering all those analyses, then you come up with, for different SMAs, you, have, you are defining your different limit states. And uh, just giving you, because the slide is, you cannot see it, so this is for nickel titanium alloy, this is which is most common. So, and for different uh, return period of earthquake, you can define your damage state. And that's how we are defining damage states uh, in terms of drift. And then another thing actually has been observed from field study that you can directly relate residual drift with your damage level. So, and from many earthquakes, it's been observed that if usually the bridge columns experience more than 1% drift, you can consider it as collapse because that is not repairable. You have to replace it. You have to demolish the bridge. So, observing various field data as well as uh, many experiment analytical numerical studies, we have also come up with some residual drift-based damage state where we define, again, slight, moderate, extensive, and collapse damage, where we say that fully operational, we defined it with 0.25% residual drift, operational is 0.5%, life safety 0.75, and collapse 1%. So that's how we defined our preliminary damage state uh, in terms of residual drift. And then, using the IDA data, we developed, uh, plot the fragilities for the residual drift for different damage states for each hazard level, and then, we take for 50% probability of accidents for each damage state, and then if we uh, put it in the table, so these are our damage states in terms of residual drift. So now the question is, we, uh, from the finite element analysis uh, using uh, fiber element uh, approach, we have come up with this residual damage and also maximum drift. Now the question is whether we can somehow predict from the maximum drift, the residual drift, or vice versa. And since we have huge amount of data by conducting uh, IDA, we could actually propose an equation where the residual drift, uh, you can, we can relate it with the super elastic strain range of the SMA and the maximum drift. So, and then we validated this equation with uh, several shake table tests that were performed at University of Nevada, Reno, and in other places and also some of the beam column connections where SMA was used in the beam uh, column and the plastic hinge region of beam column joints. And we see that this could very accurately, uh, within five to 10%, they can predict the residual diff response. And then uh, what we also did is we need, uh, because we were uh, trying to follow the direct displacement based uh, design approach for the performance based design. So we need the damping ductility relationship, which we again uh, derived it from the idea curves where uh, you have the hysteretic damping as well as uh, we consider the 5% um, uh, nominal viscous damping. And then uh, using this graph where we defined our uh, damping ductility relationship. And then we also propose the equation for this kind of SMA reinforced concrete bridge pier where uh, for the uh, known ductility you can find your equivalent uh, viscous damping. And then we followed the framework where we defined the framework in terms of residual drift, where the performance based design is defined in terms of the residual drift because the residual drift dictates directly to your damage. So the way how your design will work is you first start with the, so uh, you know your seismicity of the region, okay, and uh, then uh, you come here and choose what kind of damage level you want in terms of residual drift and say you want it operational, say, and uh, say 50%, uh, 2% uh, in 50 years, then you choose that 0.48% is your residual drift. Then you come here and choose what kind of SMA you want. Say you choose nickel titanium, so this is your superelastic strain in 6%. So based on this equation, you, can, you know your residual drift, you know your, max, uh, know your superelastic strain range, so from this equation you can find out your maximum drift. So once you know your maximum drift, you come here and you define your initial column parameters, and then you, from the uh, performance damage states that you know from your, uh, what, with what you already defined, from your damage state, you know that for this kind of SMA, your yielding is this much, in yielding drift. So since you now know your maximum drift and yield drift, you know your ductility. Now you define your ductility, come to the uh, ductility damping uh, relationship, and from the ductility you find out your equivalent viscous damping, and then you know your displacement spectra. So you come here, and for your uh, maximum uh, drift, 
you find out your effective time period, and these are the for different uh, damping ratios. So you find out your effective time period, and then the. So if you have any question, yes, please. Yes. Yeah, uh, the type of SMA that we have used, it has very good corrosion resistance, uh, almost like FRP, yeah. It has very good corrosion resistance. Yes. Any other question? Yes, please. Now, uh, I'd like to show you, uh, with this framework, uh, we uh, designed a bridge, and that is in Vancouver with soil class C, and it's a lifeline bridge with return period two, four, seven, five years. Uh, we want it to be operational, and the damage level is moderate. So from that uh, residual drift uh, level damage state, now we can know that the rest, uh, we can find out what is the target residual drift, which find it 0.6%. Uh, then we come here. So this is our 2475 year uh, return period earthquake. Uh, so then uh, I find out for uh, 2475 year return period, what is the residual drift limit, so the, which is 0.62. And then I come here, I choose what kind of material I want, I choose, say, nickel titanium. So I know 6% is superplastic strain range. Then I uh, find out that the maximum drift is 4.92%. And then I do choose the initial design uh, column parameters. And then I find out what is the yielding, the same thing that I just described. Then you find out equivalent damping. You find your effective time period. And then you do the same way I discussed. So now, this is your design uh, column and where you have 28 uh, SMA river, and this is one meter in diameter, and then you do the modeling uh, uh, with using any software, and then you uh, choose some earthquakes, you know, uh, defining that uh, spectra that matches with that spectra with two, four, seven, five year return period, and do the seismic analysis, and make sure that this is within the uh, maximum drift so our max maximum drift was 4.8% uh, on that. So this is all, uh, we took 10 earthquake records and it shows that it is within that range. And our uh, target residual drift was 0.6%. And you see that most of the records had residual drift less than 0.5%. So which satisfies the criteria. So our design is good. So we have developed this uh, residual drift based damage state for this kind of new material like shape nori alloy. Uh, reinforced concrete bridge pier. Uh, obviously, we have to understand the limitation. Shape nori alloy is an ex ex expensive material, so we had to limit the use in only in the plastic hinge region of the columns. And uh, but the good thing is, you know, like SMA, uh, like FRP, when it first came to the market, uh, it was mostly used by aerospace industries, and the price was extremely high. And as we have been using more and more, the price has significantly gone down. The same thing you can expect for shape nori alloy. The price is quite high, and material scientists are coming up every day uh, with many different types of alloys that shows this flag-shaped superelastic behavior. So over time, you will see that uh, iron-based SMAs, uh, are because most popular one currently is nickel titanium. Nickel and titanium both are expensive metals, so that's why it's an expensive alloy. But if we can come up with a very good iron-based alloy, then obviously the price will significantly go down, and you will see more and more use of SMAs in future. So with that, I would like to thank you for your patience. And I'd like to acknowledge the funding agencies, NSERC, and uh, the different program, uh, Discovery Grant Industrial Project Studies, uh, Borshed Engineering, and UBC for supporting the research through EUGF. Thank you.